Uh, yeah, so, like, this next song is, uh, tune, 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 uh, about, like, society, man, and, uh... This is Champagne is also a band podcast. One songwriter, one song. I'm Sven, your host for a journey into the music of Champaign-Urbana. Recorded in the Blue Box studio with a songwriter from the Champaign-Urbana music scene, past or present. Welcome to Champagne is Also a Band Podcast. Today, I have Rex and Richard from the Autocorrect. And you guys can say hi. Hi. Hey there. Hey. So, you may know, I'm going to start first with Rex, you know, alphabetically. And so, Rex, you may know from this band, the Autocorrect, Electric Bitters with Nail, O Alchemy, Looking to Cheat, and for a while did some solo acoustic guitar open mic stuff and let's see junk rdi aka random noise and hsr and then richard you may also know from the autocorrect from circumstances uiuc community gamelon pleasure boat explosion box maker and oh that's it all right. Excellent. What about Misk? Oh. Misk. There oh, yeah. Misk? That would be between Box Maker and Pleasure Boat Explosion. It was just me, like my old solo thing, and I always forget I did it. Excellent. <laughs> well, does that mean that there's some recordings out there or no? Yes. Yes. All right. On, on, on the interwebs? Yes. And they are very expensive if you want to download them. But if you download them all, I will compose and perform a song just for you. What? All right. We'll have to put that. We're going to put a pin in that and like uh, put that on the notes. So uh, it's a steal at like $1,600. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. We're going to this. OK. All right. Well, so today we're going to be listening to the song Singularity from the album Come See the Future. And uh, I guess without further ado, as I like to say, let's listen to it. Mailbox one, you have 15 old messages. Hey, it's me. I notice you're not answering the phone. I'm a little worried about you. I just want to know if I heard you correctly.
I guess the first thing that always pops into my head, which is also the question that I'd love to ask, is, so was it the words first or was it the music first? Oh, it, it was definitely the music first. And <clears throat> I'm going to say that in discussions for this podcast, Richard suggested, oh, Singularity, we should do that one because he actually said, you should do that one, Rex, because I think it's the best lyrics you've written for the band, which I don't really disagree with although i have my own issues with anything that i write um but then i said i can't do that alone because those lyrics would not have taken the form that they took if it weren't for the music that we already had so you already had the music laid out and uh was that predominantly you richard that started the music i'm assuming uh sorry let me scroll back just a second but you it sounds like you're not necessarily playing is is that a baritone that you're playing or is it's that a bass the, six a bass six okay is, that was going to be my second yeah. guess but because uh, it's it's like that it's it's the bass tones but the the kind of more of the range of the guitar sort of like it's it's the mid middle ground between the two yeah excellent so uh, is that is that one of your predominant instruments for the autocorrect that is all i use is a bass six okay. and the way i have it tuned i i have the lower two strings tuned down a bit so that i can hit some chord in the guitar range and then have this low bass note ringing out yeah you can hear that and and actually what was the first part that you came up with in terms of the music was it like the I guess you could say the verse part, or was it the chorus, or was there something particular that, that happened that you're like, that's it? Or In our formative days, when we were still just jamming around on stuff, I threw in the verse part, and it is actually a riff I had been sitting on since college, and back in the 90s, and had, hadn't had really found a place for it, and I was messing with it, and it was on a guitar, tuned differently, so... I started playing with it and my main thing whenever I want to experiment is like, well, can I slow it down? Because I just like playing slow. So we slowed it down. I added an extra couple of beats and it turned into the verse riff. And oh, uh, I remember when you added those beats, that was, <laughs> that, that threw me off when you started doing that. And then <laughs> I think we just stumbled on a chorus riff. And then a couple weeks later, I was sitting around at home noodling and came up with the second part, like the whole second half of the song. And this is so long ago, I don't really remember, but I think I came in and I was like, hey, you know that really pretty song we have? What if it got really ugly and completely different? And I showed him that and somehow it went over. Well, it's funny. It's it's almost like that part, it, not bearing the lead or anything like that, but I was going to, I'm going to stick a pin in that because i do want to re uh, want to turn to the the part where this song turns so to speak so in the beginning you have these i guess you could say voicemail messages before we began recording i think you said something about uh, or maybe it was while we were listening that you said that the the woman 
I'm assuming that the woman that, that left a message that said, is I want to make sure that I understood what you said, and if uh, I understood what you said, and if so, really? How did that whole thing come about where you wanted to add these voicemails? Sorry, I'm, I'm, this, this is now years ago, so I'm trying to put myself back into the mindset, like what all was going on then. So there were a few things going on, and one of them was that I had been going around just interviewing people, looking for little tidbits, sound bites that I might use somewhere. So I had various audio recordings of some people's voices. My oldest sibling had passed on in the 2000s, and my mom gave me the cassette tape from her answering machine. So I ended up using some of that. It was listening to that cassette tape that kind of got me into the idea. The narrator for this song is clearly, uh, I would say, a he's rather defensive. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And so, so, you know, I, I was kind of thinking, well, you know, while Richard is setting the stage sonically for what happens next, then maybe, you know, I will set the stage from more of a narrative perspective as to, you know, why is this guy in the state that he's in? Why is he just so upset with people? And it's maybe that people are making fun of him, or at least he perceives it that way. And so that was kind of where all of that came from. Let me kind of jump in with, I guess, my interpretation of where the the, the singularity, what what this is referring to is this i mean the singularity in itself is this sense of unification or maybe even perceived as control by like an artificial intelligence and and joining of like human minds and artificial intelligence and then blurring that right, into this right. basically the, the moment at which a machine achieves actual sentience i i thought it was a little bit more than that like that it was that it was more of like that there was yeah, there's, that, that there's kind more, of no going back kind of, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's more to it potentially. And there are also other kinds of singularities, but that's the one I was kind of focused on for this. I don't know if I should go into some kind of interpretation or I should allow oh, you feel to free. Kind of go. We'll, we'll tell you if you're wrong. No, well, I can, I can be wrong. That's fine. <laughs> you know, that's you know are, but are you wrong? Really? I mean, I'm really curious to know what the song says to you. So I've misinterpreted one of his other songs <laughs> and... We go back and forth on whether the song has a happy ending or not. Oh, uh, that one now. Richard. Well, this one obviously <laughs> is, is very happy because a cleansing flame is coming and people are just looking forward to It's happy to for cleansing. someone. <laughs> That's true. Well, you know, she's, she's a person, not a thing. So there you go. It might be happy for her. So it seems like this starts off with this kind of you have fallen in love with this sentient AI. The thing that I notice is that, yes, you when you mentioned before, that's very defensive. But it's also like you talk about all the things that you would in a human that you would find attractive or, or the things that you've fallen in love with. And but you equate it with their, I don't know, you, you know, their pixels on the screen uh, you know, her fractal complexities and then, you know, tweaking her code. But I, I think in some ways when I look at that, the kind of the tweaking her code, I'm like, well, that's kind of a relational thing where you're like, you kind of always hope that, that a person might change a little bit, you know, as uh, I guess is what I was thinking. But in the end, it's, it's, she's just gone. I'm, I'm using the pronoun she because you use she, but, but it, it turns out that as, as kind of fallen in love with this AI, in a sense, that it it also seems that not only is is she getting you all to fall in love with her, but also she's doing that to everyone else, and then slowly kind of taking over all of the things, the kind of things that we we fear with like the the iRobot kind of story. In a sense of protecting that it also you're just not good enough, so the human race has to go or be controlled or be made safe. Which yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I I said I I thought I would do that a lot better, but <laughs> no, um, that's all right. <laughs> well, I mean this 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 is a very should I say dense song? I mean, uh, it's, yeah, it's lyrically dense, and then it also it's ridiculously dense. I would say, <laughs> but but the one thing that I noticed that I almost want to say that the the synth voice that's being used in in the beginning that kind of is is repeating that one uh, you you hear it more predominantly yes there's lower parts to it but there's also that one voice that keeps going and it's very sweet and loving and then about mid midway when you say one day she'll understand and at that point 
that's before it even changes to- like it changes key but the synth has already turned into this kind of gritty kind of foreshadowing like oh shit um kind of thing and i do want to ask about that and i just uh, want to say andy's synth tones on that song are just <laughs> freaking phenomenal we could release um, a version with just his track oh my god i could just listen to that i mean seriously i really you know, oh, yeah wow. and 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 i remember he was very dismissive of his his work on this song and i was just like oh my god it's so awesome but hey whatever let's go to that part where the the one day she'll understand it might be today and then the end of that line is one day she will be free and at that point you do this almost like this picture you third where you change into it sounds to me as if you're changing to like the relative minor or you're changing much, to like yeah. you're modally changing the same kind of guitar phrase that or sorry uh bass six phrase <laughs> um and then it's like oh oh shit we've gone too far and now there's no going back anyway that was me just kind of pontificating a little bit but i, I just is there a particular spot that's like your favorite i guess start with you rex uh, what, what's your favorite part of the so i'm actually going to say i think that th- i i love lyrically just the first half of the song i i really that was what kind of drew me in and because almost all of the songs that we write end up like marrying these different musical components that sometimes are very tonally different from one another and that's very challenging to write for lyrically and so i have to kind of try and figure out well what how am I going to handle that change? What's this story I want to tell? And I've been reading a book called Constellation Games, which actually is, I think it's the only novel this guy ever wrote. He's like a Ruby programmer, wrote this okay. <laughs> novel about, uh-huh. actually about first contact with aliens. But there's a subplot where there is, is a programmer who had written an app, like a girlfriend app for his phone but it's like somehow it like the code got intermingled with alien code and she becomes sentient and it was like this really weird subplot that i just kind of seized on as like yeah i'm gonna tell that story it was just a challenge to try because the thing is you said called this lyrically dense i would say yeah ridiculously dense and the thing is that songs don't lend themselves towards you know narrative (laughs) exposition like i tried to use it here so it was it was a challenge to figure out well how do i actually represent these things how do i how do i represent a relationship between human being and a program that they at least ostensibly wrote a good chunk of and make it not a joke and and so i think that that's really just my favorite part of the song, lyrically speaking. When you said how, how to make it lyrically not a joke, I would say almost the background music, the supporting music is what made it not a joke in some ways, too. Yeah, because yeah, it's, it helps it's so lot. very heavy right. and serious, but also has some very, it, that, that synth voice is the thing that kind of elevates it. Also, Richard's looping that he does, like that uh-huh. he starts in the beginning mm-hmm. with underneath the voicemails, that's also running underneath everything, too. And I think it's that combination of that awesome looping and Andy's fantastic synth voices that he was using that gives it this like sparkly, like reverence almost. There's mm. something really kind of cool about that the tone of the beginning of that song richard what is your favorite part of this song probably that drone he mentioned that i run under the whole first half we had to go back and forth a lot on mixing to make it just audible enough but not overpowering because i wanted it in between the notes or if you just kind of spaced out a bit you could still hear it running through and there are like some notes that crash into each other because there's a G and an F sharp that kind of alternate. So it kind of bounces around and there's a little bit of crashing that makes you uncomfortable, but it's underneath all of this pretty stuff. And also just the tone Rex got out of my guitar. And for this one, since we were recording, usually the thing I like about a bass six is that you can have this range of notes, but for recording i would overdub the low notes on a bass to give them a little bit of extra thickness this one even though it's on a bass six i feel like it's almost just a bass song because most of it's in bass range and it feels like a bass part to me it's one of my favorite bass parts i've done and i didn't cringe when listening to it two years later (laughs) that's good interesting though you you were saying that kind of that 
clash of the G and the F sharp. It's interesting to me that that's, in a way, when we talk about how information is is jumbled and we think about the internet in itself, like, I bet you if you were to somehow make the internet sound or make (laughs) music with the internet or turn it into some kind of auditory signal, that it probably would be just a cacophony of different sounds, which in some ways, I mean, kudos, I think that that having a loop in the bottom that has this like running, sometimes our our own minds can't break down just a little dissonance. Yeah. It's it's kind of a majestic cacophony, really. Yeah. There you go. (laughs) And I say cacophony when I said that I meant in a very like good way, because I didn't, I wanted it to be beyond just that. It was just dissonance that it was also, you're also talking about the perception between what is someone human being able to understand something and then a machine being able to understand something and and having that balance be when you had laid out the music then did you start singing over it or how did that kind of how did that get formed yeah i i actually think that i had a recorded version from band practice that i put on in the car when I was like commuting to work and I would just sing over it and try and come up with melodies that I liked. Uh, And I'm going to come back to this, this first half of the song, which it's funny because there's so much that happens in the second half of the song, but the first half of the song was like the critical thing for everything. I mean, uh, I found the second half just easier to write melodically, easier to write lyrically. Uh, The first half was just hard. It was hard to find a melody that did what I wanted it to do with Richard's awesome majestic bass guitar slash whatever bass riff uh and and so so i i remember that i played around with that for a long time before finding a a melody line that i was happy with so richard what is your interpretation of what happens at the end to our narrator i don't know i think he gets kind of shoved aside and the ai takes over and bye bye humans we had it coming (laughs) I do like the repeat of the stanza of the intro to the, the lines where it says, one day you'll understand. And I, I see that, of course, the turning point is the one day she'll understand. And is, would you say that that is when that was the, the turning point where that's, that's where she understands that humans got to go? <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and, and there's, there's so, uh, you know, my rhyme, of course, is, you know, when I point her outside of the land, which is my, you know, mm-hmm. like one of those more cheesy rhymes that i got in the song but hey whatever but you know i think that that's kind of the key here is that when when she finally is able to kind of hoover up all of this information beyond the little swath of you know electronics that she had access to i think that that is the the critical turning point and yes so you know when it starts with one day she'll understand clearly we're starting to move into different territory and then when she actually you know is able to kind of see the state of the world as it is assuming that she was truly written as a you know program by this must be incredibly talented programmer so this narrator who's kind of fallen in love with his creation that she was created by him and that he has informed you know her formative understanding of the world and that he's someone who is defensive and not really doesn't seem to have a lot of great human relationships i think that that also kind of informs how then she takes this other information and stacks it on top and comes to this conclusion that oh well people clearly are messed up and you can't be counted on to actually run this planet uh the way it should be run so i'm gonna take over the line of i won't regret tomorrow the things i did today and then i won't feel sorrow for what i threw away what do you think that the narrator was refusing to regret i think he made computer girlfriend so he's kind of already turned his back on humanity and i think he's like screw it no regrets i'm doing this you know, everyone is kind of against him for it, and he knows he's doing the right thing by creating this new life. A couple lines later, that seems to be the wrong idea, but he's not <laughs> thinking about that right now. So he's just going on and doubling down on it. 
Because he's making the world a better place. Yes. Make it safe for the new singularity. This this album was recorded in your studio, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. We did an EP in 2014, I believe. The recording process for this album was very long, and we finished everything around late 2016 to early 2017. Okay. Then I made the art, and then we sent it off to be manufactured, and then we figured out a release show, and that's when we unleashed it onto the world. Let's just talk a little bit about the autocorrect as a whole and as a, uh, in its, its, uh, I want to say it's performative persona. Does that, does that sound about right? Like, sure. You, there's the, everyone is given titles, if I understand correctly, and there is a meeting agenda and your gigs or, or shows are referred to as, as company meetings or meetings. Where did that idea come about? The initial part was we were trying to figure out what to do in a live situation and like two things that were very obvious were that we were not cool in any way at all (laughs) and we were not the type of people who could do witty banter. So for the first part, we decided we were all pretty much corporate schlubs. So we just leaned into that. Nice. And then for the second part, we used Rex's sampler, which we call Roger, to do the talking for us, which is gotcha. great because he doesn't do things like, uh, yeah, so like this next song is a uh, tune, 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 uh, about like society, man. And, uh, I can, got it. Can, yes. can everyone like come closer to the stage. Well, and also no. for yes. for a bit more context too. It, so when this this band kicked off, you know, I'm I typically have a stack of books that I'm working through, and David Burns' "How Music Works" had just come out, and I was reading that book uh, while we were doing some of our early practices. He had a whole chapter where he talked about staging of a band, and kind of the importance of stage banter and how most bands suck at it, you know, and how, how it's actually really important that you figure out what you want to say. And you say those things and you say them quickly and effectively and move on and kind of talking about how the, you know, how a band presents itself and all of this. And so I, uh, this just started a conversation with the, you know, I was like, okay guys, you know, I was reading this and these are some really good points, but you know, in, other bands i've been in we've never really talked about how we wanted to present ourselves or any of these other things why don't we actually like make it a conscious choice why don't we figure out what we are and then present ourselves as that and then that's where we came up with well we can't try and present ourselves as like something super cool because we are not super cool you know so let's let's try and maybe present ourselves more like kind of who we are which is well we're all middle-aged guys who work in it jobs you know and so maybe that's the persona of this band that's kind of where that conversation started and then we landed where richard we have a dress code yes we have a dress code (laughs) yes although if we have a show on friday fridays are casual and mandatory hawaiian shirts the agendas were also a great way of um being able to try and communicate what the song na- names are to people right. in a way yeah. that, that's like not just saying oh and you know now we're gonna play this song and it's called this and it's about this and so hey you know and so you know it was just a, a way of trying to take the format of a show and you know kind of office humor and combine those two and you know so it works for whoever it works for but you know i will say for our last show because it was so hot my title is the director of human resources <laughs> and i dictate the dress codes i lifted the dress codes and allowed shorts for this show because I was, I was actually going to show up in a tie and slacks believe it or not i had them all picked out on my bed for that show and then then you discarded the dress code and i was like okay i guess i'll be a slob and then we had a storm and the temperature dropped 20 degrees oh. <laughs> But 
Yeah, and we also had an agenda printing issue that resulted in no agendas being distributed at the show. So, you know, hey, whatever. It, it seems like every meeting that I've ever been to, right? <laughs> just, <laughs> things happen. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to support Jubilee Cafe. Jubilee Cafe is a free weekly meal program at Community United Church of Christ, 805 South 6th Street in Champaign, Illinois. Jubilee Cafe serves a home-cooked meal from 5 to 6.30 each Monday. Their mission is to feed hungry people by cooking healthy, delicious meals and by serving their guests restaurant-style with servers waiting on tables. Jubilee Cafe is open to anyone who cares to eat with them. Because food insecurity among students is so high, they serve students as well as others in and around the Champaign-Urbana community who struggle with hunger. Meals are free to all and will be served each Monday evening, located in the accessible lower level of the building at 6th and Daniel Streets in Champaign. For more information on the meal or how to volunteer, Go to the Jubilee Cafe CUCC Facebook page or email them at jubilee.cafe at community-ucc.org. That's jubilee.cafe at community-ucc.org. You know, why don't we talk about the Champaign-Urbana music scene? You both have have had a history here in the champaign urbana music scene you know and it seems like uh you know at least like 20 years perhaps or so something like Um, that yes with a huge gap (laughs) but uh so did you did you take off at some point or Um, were you just not participating as when well boxmaker was my band in college and we didn't really do it we played like the red herring and a couple of house parties and then i didn't really do anything for a while and then i had my solo thing misc which was purely a home thing because i played all the instruments and there wasn't really affordable looping technology then with pleasure boat explosion that was like the first time i actually was like got out and played and was active and then right after that became was when the autocorrect happened and that was when i got more active and then last year because last year i started another solo thing because every july the rest of the band goes on vacation and i didn't want to just like sit yeah, around I'm going on vacation to tomorrow oh yeah that's right <laughs> case in point <laughs> so um throughout the years has there been a favorite venue that you that you love like that's your you know for the first half of i'm gonna hog this thing okay so sure i'll let you talk i (laughs) my favorite place to play was mike and molly's and Uh, back then i didn't really know about the diy scene so all i knew about was the club scene and suddenly all of the venues are closing and when i started my solo thing last year i ended up playing a lot of imc shows and then going to the various house shows because I reached some critical mass where I knew enough people that I could go someplace and not like have a panic attack. You know, this thing where you're the oldest person there by like at least a decade and a half, if not more. Same. <laughs> so now I really like the DIY scene because even if not a lot of people show up, you know, they're showing up for music at mixed bills that are really fun I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here and, no yeah no yeah <laughs> I, i'm gonna totally do it and and say that uh yeah at this point in time i think my favorite venue is definitely the imc uh right now although i know the imc has some issues right now with the police yeah. and permits and crap like that that could uh, potentially make this not a great venue moving forward but i love the imc because of just what richard was saying and that's why i wanted to jump in and uh, there was a specific show that crystallized this for me and that was when staghorn and indy halda played at the imc at the beginning of last year and what struck me was that these these are two bands that have an incredible dynamic range where they both will go from in really really quiet to really really loud and it was the really quiet moments where all you could hear 
was the band and that never happens i mean you go and you play in a bar and in the quiet moments you can always hear someone talking you can always hear stuff going on and it was just so awesome to be you know here in an audience i mean for the imc it was a decent sized audience but for you know a show in general i mean like 30 people is not huge right but it was great to be in an audience of 30 people who were just standing there raptly intent on the music. And that was fantastic. And it's not always like that at the IMC. It's not like everyone is always completely intent on everything that's happening, but without people being there just to drink, right? It, it's you're much more likely to get that kind of feeling, which I love. Yeah. Especially any of the DIY scenes. It's like, since they're not serving alcohol it's the goal is to go and see music and see uh out of out of state bands or or you know your favorite local band not to you know yak with everybody and that kind of thing. i will also say that <clears throat> for uh a post office the sound is really good i think that the drum sound from the stage is really phenomenally good my drums mm. never sound that good anywhere else the, the way that it breaks off into those chambers i think yeah is, is part of your transients are are not going to be all about it bouncing back at you it's right. going to be about like f you know some of the more lower tones and some of the more like snare tones are just going to go Pah! yeah oh, somehow the that. acoustics just yeah. work it's really it sounds much better than you think it should yes yes well especially since well, everything's just about all solid. Right. And there's no there's no carpeting, there's nothing to absorb any sound. No, by all rights it should it sound like shit out in other places. Yes. <laughs> when it moved from their old spot to the current post office that they're in, I mean, the DIY music scene just about cratered at least as far as the IMC was concerned. Mm. I mean, it, the the old location like where God, and now I'm dating myself, where V. Picasso used to be back when it was in Urbana. That location was just absolutely happening. But then when they moved to the post office, it's like somehow the scene didn't really make the transition, the IMC. And now that Mike and Molly's is closed and everything, it feels like the DIY scene has now finally really coalesced on the IMC again. And now the city of Urbana is like, no, no, you cannot do that. I kind of hate the fact that one incident it seems like one incident was somehow ended up blanketing the entire imc in in the city's perception that oh that's all that's going on over there and that's not necessarily a true picture of what what is happening well and i think it's very specifically the urbana police as well because i know the city of urbana has like written grants with the imc before right true. so the city of urbana okay, has yeah, has, has yeah. viewed the imc at least in years past as a partner for community events and uh, as a community center where things should happen the police clearly did not get the memo has there been a particular show that anywhere in urbana champagne that was just your favorite i'm going to start with richard on that question they have all just come into a blur but i will say another place i like to see shows and perform at is Sipyard. I'm gonna say my favorite is when I played there because I am vain. We had a solo artist showcase at Sipyard and halfway through it, it started to rain. So we all piled into one of the containers that has seating and we just all huddled together and kept going. It was really cozy and fun. Also, I just like the way my sounds bounce off the walls there. <laughs> that corrugated metal. Yeah. Yeah. That has been a surprising venue, you know, and and I feel like even versus the DIY, I have to say like Blackbird uh, has like stepped up and and like well the Iron Post has always been there, but now it's just even you know I, it it seems like even more more so. Yep, and don't um, forget the Rose Bowl too. Oh, no, absolutely. Oh yeah, Urbana is killing it these days, and Champagne is just kind of dying. I don't know what's going on there, but. It uh, seems like, and maybe this is me editorializing. I know, I know that Champagne is doing their like street festival thing mm -hmm. on some weekends, but it's just not the same. It's it's yeah. It's because I moved to Urbana a couple <laughs> years ago. <laughs> it's been, well, I think that there's been there's been a few problems with some of the very specific, like I want to say, linchpin 
venues got yes. pulled out. Like once Mike and Molly's left, and then once Cowboy Monkey just wasn't they doing it. They took the then stage high out. Dive, high Dive was, you know, High Dive became the Accord, and then well, the Accord you know, was still. But, they still had shows, but then right. But then it just yeah, it wasn't it. Yeah, and I, I liked the Accord as well, but it wasn't sustainable at that point when, it, even though they were pulling in some really amazing shows, mm-hmm. it just wasn't sustainable. And then the uh, person that took over and did, uh, I can't even remember, 54 Main. Anyway, 51 Main. 51 yeah. Main. That um, was a great place. Like, that was, they started bringing in all of these amazing drag shows, and then... 51 Main is now way out by Parkland, and Memphis on Main got shut down. It's it's the derelict block now. There's like nothing nothing in that little stretch. Uh, it's just really weird. <laughs> it feels like Exile on Main has actually stepped up and is having. It seems yes. like it's having like I would agree one, with that. Two, three shows a week. It, that is you know. another fun place to play and see shows. You can just kind of stand in amongst all the clothing and check out the music. Even if you just want to kind of passively listen, you can kind of quietly go over and thumb through all the records and CDs and things like that. I do enjoy Exile, and I feel like they're they're doing a good job of pulling in out-of-state bands and local people. And it does. It feels like it's like at least one or two shows a week. Yeah, I would agree. They've they've really stepped up, and I mean, Exile is just a treasure for this community. And 25 O'Clock has been doing a lot more things. Yes, but I, I feel like we've already praised urbana enough i was just trying to, <laughs> not I, possible <laughs> i was just trying to pull out uh, you know just because is, right. are, are we dealing with scales here like it feels like it's like you know one has to be more prominent than the other and they just kind of tip back and forth at, at right. least that's well and remember i mean back you know? back in the day it used to be campus right i mean mabel's right. and yeah. uh the the like mabel's and tritos and trinos also for a period of time um nature's table nature's table right yeah. uh you know red herring still kind of does some stuff but that red herring it, it seems like it, it kind of comes and goes depending on who's involved well but, and stuff that happens actually up in the the chapel of the channing murray is yeah is, well back in when, the day the channing yeah. murray was like the freaking spot i mean i saw so many bands in the upstairs channing murray in the 80s paul was talking about when when he first moved here and and all the all the bands that were playing up upstairs in the chapel and it's pretty amazing champagne is also a band podcast is proud to support exile on main street exile on main street located in the old train station building at 100 north chestnut street in downtown champagne has been helping to build record collections since 2004 Carrying a wide array of new and used LPs, CDs, and video games. Exile on Main Street has something for just about any music enthusiast and old school gaming devotee. Exile also hosts regular free live music shows on its stage, so be sure to check out their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages for the up-to-date details on the next upcoming event. Open seven days a week. They can be reached by phone at 217-398-MAIN. That's 217-398-6246. Rex, why don't we just start with you first? What's your favorite non-musical thing? I, I'm, I'm going to give... All right, I'll say it. My, my favorite non-musical thing is learning shit. And I know that that seems maybe kind of vague, but... You know, almost all of the songs I write are like inspired by books that I read. I read a crap ton of books and I love reading and I love talking about shit that I read and I love listening to podcasts, usually podcasts that have like fact checkers and shit, you know, because I like to learn new shit while I am driving. And so I I just love, you know, stimulating that part of my brain that's like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that makes so much sense now. And and I would even say that the same is true musically, even though you asked for non-musical. But I mean, like, you know, last year, Andy left the band. I don't know if you knew that. Uh-huh. But, you know, so Andy yeah. left the band. And, you know, then I had to, like, learn all kinds of 
other shit musically, which was super fun and, and interesting. And I, you know, so that's, that's my favorite thing. So what is your favorite mode of learning? Oh God. All right. Right now I'm going to say it's probably podcasts. And this is simply because, uh, you're on a podcast right now. No, actually oh, that's not kidding. it, but uh, that would be <laughs> probably a smart reason, but it's not my reason. Cause I don't do things for smart reasons it's it's just because my life has changed so that i am in the car a lot more than i really would like to be and podcasts have made that much better and podcasts i've realized have started to eat into the mental space that i used to reserve for reading i am not oh. reading as much wow. now that i'm listening to all the podcasts i'm listening to uh, which in a way makes me sad because i like reading but well, if you're doing it in the car, I would hope that you're not reading in the car. That would be a little disturbing. But. Well, I've seen people do it. You know, I, I mean, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. You know, if you if you if you're on the interstate enough, you'll see people doing all kinds of crap they shouldn't be doing. Is there a is there a favorite podcast? I would say 99 percent invisible is probably one of my absolute favorites. Uh, and uh, and then uh, another one which is less well known, but I think is also fantastic is called Futility Closet. And Futility Closet is like much lower budget than 99 percent invisible. But you know, it's basically this couple in North Carolina that will go and research weird apocryphal anecdotes from history. And then they'll just talk about that. And that'll be the, the podcast. And I, nice. I I found that super, super interesting. And either one of those, I always end up with like something that I'd never thought about before when it's done that I'm like, oh, that's so super cool. I have not heard of that one before. So, well, I'd recommend it. It's, it's a good, it out. good half hour long podcast that always has cool stuff and comes out once a week. So Richard, what is your favorite non-musical thing? This is going to be really anticlimactic after all that, but probably my cat. No, yeah. that's good. Yeah. And so, what's your, your... Your cat thanks you, Richard. Yeah. He knows. <laughs> he, he knows so, he's my favorite thing. Or maybe I should say, your cat will not punish you when you get home for having said that. <laughs> so, oh, well, you know, it's a cat, so maybe. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so, uh, what's your cat's name? His name is Fred. Which, Fred? That was his name at the shelter. He was part of this litter that was really huge, so... They just named them after all the people who worked at the pet store where Catsnap has a little base of operations. And oh, okay. I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I was just like, you know, he just looks like a Fred. That's his name. He's just very, he's very relaxing to be around, which usually means if he sits next to me for more than five minutes, I will fall asleep. He is kind of like me in that he's either very relaxed or very jumpy, like, He's very high strung when he's not relaxed. So there, huh. there's no middle ground. But when he's relaxed and we're just napping and chilling, it's just fun times. Fred's your only cat or my wife, you don't see the air quotes, but and anyway, she we have three cats together, but we kind of consider Fred as mine and the other two are hers cuz <laughs> the way they bonded, it's usually like whoever rescues the cat gets the tighter bond. One of hers was actually supposed to be, like, my birthday present, but it was the <laughs> she rescued him thing, so I could not break into that bond. So when I took Fred home, I locked him in my room, and we just hung out for, like, a day, and it was like... Uh-huh. So, yes. so you used Stockholm Syndrome. Yes. <laughs> but, I mean, I just wanted but to... But in a good way. <laughs> I wanted to strengthen that bond that was already there from you me rescuing me now. him. Also, just watching the three of them interact, so... I would say cats in general. I am a crazy cat lady. You mentioned uh, that organization Snap. Is it Snap? Cat Snap. Cat Snap. Cat Snap. Sorry. Yeah. Is that local, national? They're local. And the one thing I liked, although it made me really nervous, I had to fill out this huge form to apply to adopt Fred. And I was like, oh my God, am I, am I good <laughs> enough to adopt him? Will they see my love? And so I'm glad they are that they are that strict so that if one of their cats gets adopted it will go to a good home and the pet supplies plus on okay. duncan and kirby oh okay yeah, actually i like that spot they have they have a little corner there which the staff of that store one of their manager was named fred so 
I would come in sometimes and be like, hey, I got the cat named after you. <laughs> but um, I'll definitely put some notes in there about, about this organization. Cause they're wonderful. Great. That's really neat. And then, so they're at Pets Plus, but there are other locations as well, or? They might be at PetSmart out on North Prospect, and okay. I'm not sure, but I know I have some friends who volunteer for them, and we had some stray cats wandering through our yard in the winter, and we were going to try to trap them to get them taken care of. And one of them became our third cat, Winnie, <laughs> because she she wandered into the trap, we took her in got her taken care of and she was like i must have this kitten so her name is winter because that's where uh. when she was caught we're winnie for short and so you've got winter and fred and um the orange tabby his name was originally pippin because he was hobbit sized but then he started growing outward because of lots of eating so <laughs> We started calling him Big Fat. Nice. And See, that's actually consistent with hobbits, though. They Big and then, Fat the cat. And then that's just shortened to Biggle. 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 Nice. Yes. Oh. Either Biggle or Biggles or... Mr. Bigglesworth? Never that. <laughs> See, um. you know, you started this whole thing by saying, oh, you know, you're going to be so disappointed here. And actually, yours was just much more entertaining than mine. Rex and Richard, thank you so much for being on the show and talking about your song, Singularity, from the album Come See the Future by The Autocorrect. Thank you for having us. Thank Thank you you for for listening listening to Champagne Champagne is is Also a a Band band podcast. Podcast. This is Rex. This is Richard. Reminding Reminding you... Great music is out there. Go find it where you live. You almost have an NPR voice, it's so good. Do a studio South Beaker on the inside.